Hello and welcome to Big Picture. I am Vishal Dahiya and today we're going to talk about the Raisina Dialogue 2021. And the sixth edition of the prestigious Raisina Dialogue has begun on Tuesday. This time around, due to COVID pandemic, the dialogue is being held virtually from 13 to 16th of April 2021. The theme for this 2021 edition is Viral World Outbreaks, Outliers and Out of Control. In fact, there are going to be various uh, sessions wherein discussions will be held on various themes and we're going to try and understand uh, uh, you know what all those themes will be about and also uh, the the rationale and uh, you know the kind of discussions which we might witness in this uh, edition based around that particular theme the inaugural address uh, was given by prime minister narendra modi who focused on how india has helped the world in fighting the covid pandemic and how all all of us, entire world needs to come together to find solution to all the problems which we are facing. And for more on all this, we're joined by a distinguished panel of experts. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with Professor Harshvi Pant. He's head of the strategy, uh, Strategic Studies Program at ORF. We also have with us uh, Pramit Paul Chaudhary, Foreign Affairs Editor with Hindustan Times. Uh, welcome, uh, both of you gentlemen. And let me begin with you, uh, Professor Pant. Let's start by understanding uh, more about the theme for uh, this edition of Raisina Dialogue uh, 2021 and also, uh, you know, various aspects uh, around which uh, the discussion sessions uh, will be uh, revolving. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vishal. Uh, you know, as as you pointed out, uh, this the theme is the viral world. And in some ways, uh, the idea was to and, and the idea is to look at what has happened in the last year and contextualize it for uh, for the policymaking community, for thinkers, for uh, scholars, for uh, people who are interested in the state of affairs uh, insofar as the evolution of the global order is concerned. And uh, one, you know, then the, the what has happened, uh, interestingly, is that, that a number of the debates that we were having before COVID-19 struck us mm -hmm. uh, actually we came face to face with those with those debates in real time uh, during the last few months. So while on the one hand we have had, uh, you know, this, this debate on the rise of China, for example, theoretical debate almost going on for a very long time, what are going to be the consequences of China's rise? Uh, and somehow, uh, you know, when when it came to the crunch uh, last year, we mm -hmm. realized that the that the challenges from China are going to be manifold in terms of fragmentation of the global order, fragmentation of the institutional frameworks, the collapse of the multilateral environment, uh, the the discussion and debate on uh, economic interdependence, uh, su supply chain resilience, uh, and then of course the larger idea behind global governance and what are the debates on global governance that that one can map out. And, uh, you know, in between uh, was situated the whole global pandemic and the health crisis. And as you pointed out, Prime Minister talked about in his address how India almost led uh, the conversation on public health, on global public health, and tried to do so much more than perhaps many uh, expected of India and uh, even many in India expected uh, of India to deliver. So mm -hmm. in, that, in that sense, you know, what we have seen is a certain sense of leadership from India at a time of grave uh, international crisis, global health pandemic. And that, I think, is important to convey to the rest of the world, uh, which I think the story is still not being recognized, the story is not being acknowledged. So I think a large part of that conversation will also be about how countries like India have performed or have done much better in terms of leadership, in terms of providing solutions to some of the problems, than, say, the established countries, the status quo countries, who have been much and much uh, uh, too much inward looking. So I think broadly, those are those were the contours around which a lot of the debates would revolve. Just looking back at the last year and learning lessons for the global governance going forward. Indeed, and then we'll we'll come back to those uh, you know uh, thematic pillars, uh, some of which you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, around which uh, the entire discussion of the conversation during. Uh, these uh, three, four days will be uh, built on uh, in, in this edition of Rise in a Dialogue. But let me also bring in uh, Pramit here. Pramit, uh, you know, on, on that issue of uh, India walking the talk here as the Prime Minister in his inaugural address also pointing out, uh, you know, the way India has uh, shown the world or rather not only in terms of uh, by 
telling them how to do, but also acting on it in terms of helping other uh, uh, nations, uh, you know, uh, other, other countries. Uh, almost 80 countries uh, were helped by us in terms of uh, the, the COVID vaccine. And apart from that, we've also sort of, you know, managed to set an example during the first wave, uh, how to tackle the pandemic. Yeah, in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, 150 countries have also uh, received not just vaccines, but also medicine yes. from us, whether hydroxychloroquine or uh, paracetamol and so on, uh, as a consequence of COVID. And as we are the pharmaceutical hub of the world, uh, it helps, I think, uh, that you should keep your, your customers happy uh, at a moment of crisis. And so we did do that. Um, I think we, it was fortuitous in some ways. One, uh, we had a surplus at the time. We no longer do, which is why we have stopped exporting. But hopefully that surplus will, will resume at some point. But at a time when our own vaccination rates are relatively low, we were generating a surplus that, had, that was going to expire anyway, uh, because all vaccines have a life, uh, life expire. So they needed to be moved on. Um, second, and I think it's important to realize this, we are not self-sufficient when it comes to vaccines and medicines. We import a huge amounts of our, uh, our inputs, our key ingredients for vaccines and medicines from other countries as well. Uh, so we depend on the United States, on China, on Europe, on Southeast Asia for a lot of the inputs that create the vaccines that we do. So if we were to suddenly say, we will not pass this on our, what we are producing to others, then it would automatically lead to other countries. In that case, we're not going to give you the ingredients by which you produce these same medicines, uh, mm -hmm. and we'll keep it for ourselves. So it's important to realize that we are not, all of us uh, are ultimately on the same boat uh, when it comes to COVID. Uh, no man and definitely no country and definitely no supply chain, supply chain is an island. We all have to be part of this together. Indeed. So, but... Is you correctly correct that we on things like, co especially among developing and lo least developed countries, India has emerged or they did, it has emerged at least in the beginning phase mm -hmm. as the primary supplier of vaccines to places like Africa, the Middle East, uh, to even Latin America. Um, other countries have now moved in as well, notably China. Uh, but uh, we uh, have, as you've mentioned, exported a remarkably large number uh, of vaccines. Indeed, and uh, therein lies, uh, you know, the, the point which has been made by the Prime Minister again saying, uh, you know, a collaborative approach to all the problems is something which uh, he was hinting there. Let's now look at, uh, you know, these, these thematic pillars uh, one by one, and uh, therein lies uh, the, the main issues in terms of where we need to have uh, that collaborative approach. Uh, I'd like to start with you, Professor Pant, and then one of the first ones is uh, about, uh, you know, uh, WHO's multilateralism, uh, reconstructing United Nations and beyond. That uh, what we are trying to, and then this is an issue which we have debated earlier as well in this particular show about how uh, there uh, is uh, urgent need for reforms uh, in, in international bodies like United Nations. Uh, you know, uh, Vishal, what what really happened, I think, uh, during the initial phase of COVID-19, that the world realized that, you know, those those kind of discussions that we used to have, the balance of power is changing and suddenly institution, the existing institutions would come under stress. Suddenly they emerged out of textbooks into the real world that here was WHO, for example, uh, that was, you know, that was uh, not allowed or that that could not provide the kind of multilateral leadership that was required because one particular country was molding WHO in a certain direction. Now, this was a debate that was, uh, you know, that was academic before COVID-19, uh, largely academic before COVID-19. And suddenly, uh, when the world realized that what is happening to our multilateral institutions is that they were getting uh, crushed from both sides. On the one side, you had countries like the U.S., uh, and even the Europeans who were who were trying to look more and more inwards, less invested in these uh, institutions that they had created in the first place. And mm -hmm. on the other, you had countries like China that were gaming the system. So I think the challenge became how do you, uh, you know, how, how and challenge is how do we think of global multilateralism in today's context where fragmentation is the reality, 
where the questions uh, where, where questions about uh, certain countries and their uh, you know their proclivity to game the system is becoming more and more pronounced so countries like india that believe in the role for multilateral institutions uh, are certainly anxious and that was also reflective for example in prime minister's address to un general assembly last year wherein he said you know how long can uh, india wait 1.3 billion people wait uh for reforms in un security council if and and i think uh, he also did something interesting he shifted the goal post saying uh, that look uh, while india can wait and india will find other ways and india cannot be ignored uh, if india is not part of this discourse then it is the credibility of un security council itself that gets affected or mm-hmm. largely the credibility of multilateral institutions that get affected so i think what we are looking at today is trying to figure out what sort of uh, multilateral institutions we need in this day and age do we need formal institutional structures or do we need informal loose coalitions like for example the quad that has emerged in the indo pacific so what kind of a multilateral architecture are we looking at uh, at a time of great flux at a time of great uh, consequence for the global environment where certainly some of the fundamental questions are being asked about global governance and their future and in that context at uh, this uh, you know pillar is very, very important because this is where it would uh, i think hopefully the conversations at the dialogue and beyond uh, would highlight the challenge as well as the opportunity that exists in redefining the contours of contemporary multilateralism okay indeed they need uh, this is a very very uh, significant aspect there pramit uh, your views there on uh, you know the importance of uh, uh, this this uh, multilateralism uh, in in international institutions or uh, multilateral international institutions specifically in today's context and the lessons which we have learned in the past uh, you know uh, sort of an year and a half uh, uh, as as uh, professor pant is pointing out uh, those academic uh, you know largely academic discussions uh, seem to have uh, you know uh, been played practically in front of our eyes are uh, completely correct as he's, as prof- as, as uh, professor pant has mentioned uh, the who the world health organization was an organization nobody paid any attention to it just worked on its own it handled uh, fought smallpox and did whatever it wanted virtually no journalist or scholar paid much attention to the who it was one of these uh, un organizations that was basically seen as purely technical and had no real international relations element to it uh, and of course it's now suddenly come under this enormous spotlight and is now the lead organization if you wish mm-hmm. uh, in fact the only real multilateral organization in terms of response to covid and has therefore become highly uh, uh, politicized mm-hmm. um yes we have seen the wto come under stress in the past uh, couple of years we have seen um WHO become much more important we have seen the birth or the or should you say the maturing of the quad and organization uh, which nobody was quite certain was really what it really was about it seemed to be uh, on paper uh, never had issued a joint statement and now suddenly it has a joint statement it has three working groups four working groups and it has uh, a head of some it has a genuine summit uh, uh-huh. incorporated into it and we're now seeing other countries coming in and saying maybe we wouldn't mind joining or working with the quad um as as a separate institution um so yes a lot of these and and on the other hand organizations like the united nations uh, during the height of the pandemic have actually been relatively irrelevant uh, nobody's really looking at the un uh, as uh, for guidance or or anything uh, regarding mm-hmm. the pandemic so yes we we need the the global inst- a lot of global institutions have come out of stress and there's been a certain clarification if you wish uh, uh about certain trends that we knew were happening but we weren't certain when they would sort of mature what the quad which prob- may have taken another 5 or 6 years to come into a genuine sense of of uh, of uh, organize as, as an actual organization has suddenly come into in, 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 into a genuine um uh, existence or a full bloom if you wish Indeed. um so you're seeing that happening and the the pandemic the the sudden shift of power uh increasingly in china's favor if you wish right now uh america's disappearance for four years under trump reappearance of the biden and, and uh-huh. really fast years biden is clearly working as hard as possible to compensate for those last four years okay. means that we're a lot of things happening in a sort of very fast track 
uh, rather close to what we normally see in a much more gradual international situation. Okay. Okay. Indeed. Now, now that we're talking about multilateralism and obviously, you know, uh, in, in context uh, to uh, the COVID pandemic and WHO was a but related aspect here, and that's that's one of the other themes as well, uh, Professor Pante, is, is about, you know, uh, holding actors and nations to account. Uh, this obviously deals with uh, ensuring peace and security everywhere as well. But this also involves that, uh, you know, that approach where uh, everybody has a say instead of just one of you. Yes, I think, you know, that, that that question of accountability is going to become more and more significant in some ways because uh, as the power distribution changes and new actors are becoming important, how do we ensure that certain, uh, you know, fundamental red lines are maintained, uh, some of the fundamental principles are followed, uh, where the principles on which there seem to have been at one point uh, in time uh, global consensus or, you know, a relatively large consensus suddenly seems to be breaking down. What do we do with that? And I think a lot of the times when we have, you know, in, in this context, we, for example, uh, the question of China arises. Now, China uh -huh. is a rising power. I think some amount of turbulence is to be expected. But if a rising power starts challenging uh, the, uh, you know, the rules of the game in such fundamental ways, uh, that not only bilateral engagements, but also regional, global, uh, multilateral institutions start crumbling under the weight uh, of that rise. Then I think the question is, how do you make a country like that accountable? Because uh, you know uh, there, there have been bilateral attempts, there have been some attempts by certain countries to push back. Uh, there have been individual uh, countries standing up to, for example, China. Uh, you know, in some cases like India, we have had to deal China. Uh, uh, you know, uh, militarily. You have countries like Australia dealing with that economically. You have ASEAN countries that are trying to build coalitions and and do something in South China Sea without much effect. So the challenge, therefore, is how do we make sure that those countries that are challenging challenging the fundamentals of this uh, of this uh, and make them accountable? And in this in in this context, you can link it to this idea. Look, uh, we still don't know where this uh, you know this whole uh, how, how does how did this pandemic how did this how did it start? And if you look at WHO's role, if you look at the kind of reportage, the kind of efforts that they have made, uh, the, the disinformation campaigns uh, and how information has not been given to them, access has not been given to them. You know, that poses some fundamental questions that if, if mm -hmm. uh, a, a crisis like the one that we are facing today, which is primarily a global health crisis, if even on a crisis like this, we are not able to uh, uh, you know, provide accountability, we are not able to ensure global coordination, forget cooperation, then I think the challenges for global order are certainly going to accentuate if, if nothing is done about this very fundamental question. So I Indeed. think in some ways it is linked to the larger question of global order and multilateralism that we have been talking about as to how do we make sure that those actors that perhaps are having, having a negative impact on the global architecture are made more accountable for their actions. Okay, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's all about ensuring a rule-based international order in, in the broader concept out there, something uh, which, uh, you know, uh, we were earlier discussing about as well. Uh, Pramit, your views there on, on, on ensuring that all these things are interlinked, you know, we, we're trying to understand uh, how uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, the situation which is uh, now emerging has, has sort of, you know, explained to us all those uh, academic ideas or academic discussions uh, practically, uh, you know, happening out there. And uh, internationally, it is really important uh, to ensure that uh, rule-based order and, 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 you know, bringing uh, those who are uh, guilty, uh, you know, make them accountable. Well, I think what we're seeing, going to be seeing, and, we, and again, I think the point of the idea that you've seen a degree of clarification, if you wish, or during the pandemic, uh, is a very clearly now countries are going to be asked to choose between in many ways two basic sets of rules, one that's set by China and one set by the United States and its friends, uh, including India. So whether it's, if you look at the so-called techno-alliance strategy that the Biden administration is talking about, that your certain types of countries uh, will work together on the internet, for example, the rules governing the internet, the rules governing 5G, the supply chains in pharmaceuticals, uh, defense, aerospace, and so on. And it's pretty obvious that certain countries, notably China and its allies, will walk out of these relationships, uh -huh. these alliances, because the rules that are being set, uh, whether it's on 5G, on data, 
and so on, will be unacceptable to China. And that, that, that separation, if you wish, the parting of the Red Sea is taking place globally now. So you're not going to see a rules-based order, you're going to see two rules-based orders, who in many ways will be in competition with each other over the next 10 years. There will obviously be certain areas of cooperation. We cannot fight pandemics separately. We cannot uh, fight climate separately, but we can run electrical vehicles on separate sets of standards. Uh, and that will be a struggle. Countries like India, to some degree, I think already too close to the United States to really, and our relationship with China obviously is, is poisonous, so it's really no real, real choice, if you wish, for us. But if you look at the rice in a dialogue, we've put a lot, a lot of emphasis on Africa this time. Paul Kagame, president of Rwanda, a number of African leaders, uh, diplomats were there and spoke, uh, because in many ways Africa is a sort of the swing continent, if you wish, in all of this. It's a continent whose GDP is roughly the same size as India's, its population is about the same size, but it is a continent that is six or seven times larger uh, than India and has huge resources, and it's going to be in many ways one of the big uh, deciders of the future, if you wish. Uh -huh. And you can see Africa has become very important to the Chinese. The Belt Road Initiative, almost all of its present investments now are taking place in Africa um, because the Chinese see this as part of the future, that the, whoever rules Africa will effectively have a balance of power uh, that is shifted strongly in its favor. So okay. it's, 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 uh, it's, it's important. That's why I think it was important for people like uh, Kagame to come uh, to the Rice in a Dialogue. Okay. Okay. A quick concluding comment from you, uh, Professor Pant, on uh, you know uh, looking at the collaborative approach here, as, as Prime Minister was pointing to, and and all these uh, thematic pillars which we are talking about, and there are a few more as well. Uh, we're running short of time, but we'll we'll come back again on them uh, as well in detail. For example, dealing with infodemic, you know, uh, uh, giving a push to green solutions as well, and uh, the uh, supply chain aspect, which uh, you know, uh, Pramit also mentioned, quite a lot uh, there. Uh, Professor Pant, you'll have to unmute yourself, sir. Uh, and if you see, uh, Vishal, uh, all of these flow into one another. So, for example, the two that we have discussed, uh, multilateralism and this uh, the sense of accountability, bad actors, and how do we make sure they're accountable. And then, you know, you have this whole issue of, uh, as, as Pramit was discussing, you know, almost uh, different dimensions or two different uh, or, or multiple different world orders emerging, uh, rules of the game, game uh, emerging, and how do we make sure that uh, uh -huh. You know, those are, you know, uh, those remain uh, in in uh, in some ways uh, in conversation with each other, despite the differences, but also Indeed. to ensure issues like, for example, supply chain resilience. Uh, how do how do we make sure in this day and age of economic inter interdependence, where we are relooking at some of these assumptions, how do we make sure that supply chain resilience bec becomes a fundamental aspect of global economic order? So then okay. you have the, the issue of polarized politics and you have the issue of green transition. All of them are largely part of this idea of in a, in a, in a world that, that is being reshaped by COVID-19 crisis. How do we ensure that all the stakeholders have a viable conversation with each other and where the conversation is not possible, perhaps those that are like-minded can offer alternatives to the okay. ones that are being offered by, by actors that are perhaps not as responsible as you would like them to be. Okay, indeed, uh, there it is. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Pant, as well as uh, Pramit, for sharing your views and insights uh, on what exactly is uh, happening in the sixth edition of Rise in a Dialogue. The themes out there and issues which are being discussed. Uh, we'll come back again uh, with a different aspect uh, and a different set of guests as well. Till then, keep watching. Thank you.